speaker, Sebastian. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Jerry, for having me. Um, I think so. Does that sound okay? Do, can you hear him? Can no, you hear me okay? That one, the other one. The other one was green. All right, good, good, sorry. Okay. Right. Can everyone hear him? Is that okay? Okay. So the title of my talk today is Simulating a Universe in Tidyverse Using R to Generate Statistical Simulations. And I've envisioned this talk to be for a person that maybe knows a lot about Tidyverse but doesn't know how to run simulations using the Tidyverse. Or maybe a person that knows a lot about simulations but wa wants to try them out in Tidyverse. Uh, so I'm a data scientist of Room. And Vroom is an e-commerce company that buys used cars, sends them to this huge factory and fix them, and then we list them on our website, vroom.com. And so if you go on the website, you can order the cars to be delivered to your house. And so we have tons of uh, data analytics and data science uh, needs, and we do simulations uh, pretty often. And so in this uh, talk, what I would like to cover is uh, reasons why uh, simulations are useful at all. And then I'm going to cover some of the basics of generating random data in R. And how do you integrate that random data in, in, in using dplyr and the tidyverse? And that kind of sets up the framework of how to run a simulation. And I will go on, on three examples. The first example is to run a simulation of, of, of a regression model. And uh, with that uh, set up, we can do a power calculation uh, in, in for an A-B test. And my last example is going to be to generate random data in order to create art. And so in this talk, I'm going to focus in the packages dplyr, tidyr, per, and ggplot2. And there's probably other ways to do simulations even with these tools, uh, other than the one I'm going to present here. Um, and there's other ways that you can run simulations without these tools. So like you can use base R and use combinations of nested for loops. Uh, you can use the Drake package, uh, which I found quite useful lately. And you can also use a specific packages for simulation. So there's packages to simulate uh, ra um, missing data or survival data. Uh, but there's others, other ways you can do this as well. Uh, so why would you want to do a simulation at all? So in this talk, I'm going to focus first on uh, data science educational purposes. And what I mean by that is sometimes you learn a new method, uh, a machine learning method or a new statistical model, and you're a little bit confused about how it works. So I always find it really useful to simulate a lot of data and just train your model or run your method on that data. And as you change the sample size or the number of variables or correlation among variables, you get a lot of insight on how your method works or in which situations uh, a model will work best. So that's really useful. Uh, also, you can always use a simulation to do a power calculation if you're doing a study design for an A-B test. And also, you can have some fun and make some art. Uh, not that power calculations are not fun. But, uh, <laughs> uh, other reasons are that uh, at Room we use it to understand business processes. So we might simulate data of cars that are coming into a factory, and we, we simulate data on how long they're going to take to get fixed, and then how long they take to be delivered to a customer, and that way we can find out about bottlenecks in our system. Um, another reason is to generate useful fake data, and uh, recently I was working with a data analyst. She needed to uh, create this dashboard uh, that takes as input uh, some data generated by a model, but the model is going to be in production like a month from now, but the, that dashboard, we will want it to have it ready now. So I created this fake data of how the data will look like, and she was able to create the dashboard you know, uh, on time before we launched the model to production. And there's other ways, uh, there's other reasons why you will want to simulate data. Uh, so how do you simulate data in R? So some of the basics are these functions that start with R, and I guess they mean random. And I'm going to focus on three of them. So the R norm function, the R Poisson function, and the R binomial function. So the R norm function simulates na randomly distributed data with a normal distribution. And the first outcome, N, is the sample size of so how many uh, data you want to simulate. The mean is just the mean of the normal distribution, and SD is the standard deviation. So you will want to uh, use this function when you want to generate continuous outcomes. 
Um, another very useful uh, function is the rplus function, which is for random Poisson variables. And it only has one parameter, lambda, which is the mean, but as well as its variance. And if you want to simulate data that looks like count outcomes, uh, this one is really useful. And another useful function is R binomial, uh, which will simulate a binary outcome if you set the size equal to zero. And this is really useful to simulate uh, A-B tests because you can simulate zero once corresponding to a random assignment on, on, a, on a test. And there's other functions that you can use if you want to look at skewed positive data, exponential distribution, but I won't cover those in this talk. And so how can you start using uh, these um, um, functions that generate random data in, in R? So the first thing that you can do is create a data frame and call that column R sample and assign it your random sample that comes from your R normal function in this case. So this, in this column, R sample is going to live a normally distributed data and there's going to be uh, 10,000 data points in this data frame, and they're going to have a mean of 1,000 and a standard, a standard deviation of 250. And then if you, are not, if you are new to the tidyverse, then this symbol over here is the pipe, which comes from dplyr. And what that says is I'm going to create this data frame, and then I'm going to apply to it this ggplot function that's going to create the graph underneath. And so to create the graph, you tell the ggplot function, please use as your input data the R sample, my random data. And to it, I'm going to add a histogram with the geom histogram function and ask it to give me 300 beans. And then I'm going to create a vertical line uh, to specify the mean of the sample at 1,000 with the geom vline function. And I want that line to be red. And then I'm going to add a theme uh, called line draw, which is this uh, uh, beautiful uh, black and white theme that I really like. So then we see that our data um, looks normal and has a mean roughly of 1,000. Uh, and you can do the same thing with the R Poisson function. So now your R sample column contains uh, Poisson distributed data with a mean of three. And if you plot again the histogram of it, we see that instead of being continuous, it's a discrete integers with mean of three. And if you do that, the same thing with the R binom function, we get a zero, uh, zero one outcome variable. Um, and we see, because I set the probability to be 50%, that we that out of the 10,000, we get 50, uh, roughly 5,000 5, zeros and 5,000 ones. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. So then how would you incorporate these uh, functions in, in, in the tidyverse, specifically at dplyr? So the first function that I use, that I found really useful for this, is the slice function. So the definition of the slice function says that this function chooses the rows by the ordinal position in the table or the data frame. So if I fit a data frame to the slice function and a vector we want to tree on it, it will output the row one, two, and three of that data frame. But then if I want to do something more elaborate and I fit to the slice function this repeat function, what the repeat function is going to do is going to repeat one and two, each one of them three times. So then when the slice function reads this vector, it's going to output the rows uh, uh, one three times and two three times. And I can generalize that even further and say, okay, repeat function, I want one to be repeated two times, but I want the number two to be repeated three times. So then when I feed that to the slice, I'm going to have the row, first row repeated once as twice and the second one repeated three times. So why, I mean, this seems all kind of boring, but um, uh, the reason why this is very useful is because simulations have a nest nested structure of repeated observations. So if I have a thousand simulations, the, I want to be that simulation to be repeated, let's say, a hundred times for, to ha so that that simulation will have a hundred observations. And this saves you most of your headache while doing simulations because it will set up kind of like the skeleton of the simulation. And after you've done that, you can start generating tons of data. So let me go over a simple example here. So let's say I have a simple A-B test with three cars, and I want to uh, simulate this A-B test twice. So I'm going to create a data frame that has uh, uh, three observations and a column from uh, observations ID going from one to, to two to three. But because I have two simulations, I want to repeat these observations twice. So then I use the slice function, and I feed it the repeat uh, function to it, and I say, please repeat my observation ID each of them twice. So now if I've repeated each of my observations twice, so I have um, 
um, just the uh, behavior I wanted because I wanted uh, them to be appear twice there. Uh, but then the next thing I want to do is I want to create a simu simulation ID column. And what that column is going to keep in there is, is the indicator for that simulation. Since I have two simulations, I want uh, the simu ID column to be the numbers one and two repeated each of them three times because each of them contain three observations. And then with the arrange statement, what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrange uh, the, the data frame by the simulation ID and then the observation ID. And then I'm going to, with the select statement, I'm going to select first the simulation ID and then the observation ID. And so the resulting data frame is two simulations, each one of them containing three observations. Okay, uh, so uh, that kind of sets up the skeleton of your simulation, but now I want to create fa uh, uh, random data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this uh, line to the mutate statement, which is this Poisson var over here. And what that does is going to um, call the R Poisson variable and it's going to generate data with uh, a Poisson distribution with a mean of 10. And I'm going to call this the plier function, which is the n in parentheses. And what that says is tells the Poisson, uh, the R Poisson function that it wants as many random data as there are rows in the data frame. And then the other, other thing that I'm going to do, in addition, is I'm going to rename my variables. So I'm going to call ops ID. I'm going to rename it as car ID. And then the Poisson variable, I'm going to call it online views. So then I have a data set that contains two simulations on three cars and their online views that they get on a daily basis. Um, you know, online rooms, uh, rooms website, let's say, for example. Okay, so that, with that really super simple example, what we've done is simulated uh, two simulations, but now what we're going to do is going to create a thousand simulations, and on each of those, we are going to run a regression model. So we're going to end up with a thousand regression models, and then we're going to uh, plot each of their coefficients uh, for price in them, and we're going to see a, hist a histogram of the distribution of these coefficients that come from a thousand models. So to do that, the first thing uh, is to simulate a linear model, and what you need to do is simulate a set of independent variables. And once you've done that, you need to define a mean as a linear function of those independent variables. And once you've done that, you need to simulate your outcome as a normal distribution uh, with that defined mean. And then what we'll do with, the, with the, the tidyverse is we're going to simulate data on online number of views, and we're going to re run the regression uh, with online views as outcome, and we're going to look the distribution of the effect on, on, of price on views. Uh, so this is the same data frame I showed you uh, in the previous chunk. I've just added like four more lines. So the first line is this line price over here, and what that that new column price is going to be a random sample from a Poisson uh, distribution with mean 15. And then what I'm going to do as well is create a, a, a column called miles, which has a distribution Poisson with mean 25. So I'm assuming price uh, having a, a mean 15, or 15 meaning 1,000, and 25 miles being also 1,000. And then I'm going to create a, a new column called num mean number of views. And that is going to say, okay, all of my cars have 200 views on average on my website, but every time my price or my mileage increases by 1,000, my, my, num my average number of views decreases by two. So this is what the mean number of views uh, means. And then I'm going to create the actual outcome, which is n the number of views, and that's going to have a normal distribution with the mean that you've defined in the previous line that depends both on price and miles and I'm going to assign it a, a standard deviation of 20. Okay, so and at the end with the head six statement, that's going to display the first six um, observations of this data frame. And so now we have a simulation ID, so I have two simulations, three cars per simulation, but each car gets a price, a, a, a mileage, a mean number of views, but also uh, the actual number of views that they got on the website. So you have your first uh, sort of a data frame with a, a bunch of simulations in them. Uh, so now what we want to go is apply a linear model to each of these simulations ID, but going forward, I'm going to have a thousand uh, simulation IDs that correspond to a thousand simulations. 
and I want to run on each one of those one model. So to do that, I'm going to use the nest function from tidyr. And what that nest function does is that it groups the data frame on, it separates them into different data frames, each for one simulation I do. So it groups them in separate data frames for each simulation. And then I'm going to use the map function from per package and run a linear model separately on each of these data frames. And then finally, once I uh, retrieve the coefficient for the model that I'm interested in, I'm going to put everything back together in one, in one data frame with the unnest function from tidyr. Yes? Do you see any notes that that's pretty slow? Like if you have a lot of groups? Uh, I think it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I run a simulation with like 200 and 300. And yeah, like simulations tend to be slow. Uh, but I think uh, it's more for study design. So you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't want to do this sort of thing like in production where, okay. where, where yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see the value of maybe. Is there a way to vectorize it? Um, the there's probably a way, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I focus more on like the easiness to do the simulation other than uh, the fastness, so yeah. Uh, it, it can get pretty complicated to run a simulation, I, I, in my opinion. Um, okay, so how do you apply the, this nest function once you've run uh, this data frame that I showed before? So the first thing that you need to do is uh, group your data frame with the uh, group by function and you group it by uh, simulation ID and that you need as a requirement to apply your nest function next. And so then you apply your nest function. And what we're going to do is going to save it in this uh, simu nested object, which is our nested data frame. And so what does this uh, da nested data frame look like? So if we apply the names function to it, uh, it has a vector of simulation IDs, which each ID of the 1,000 simulations, and a data object which contains 1,000 data frames, one for each simulation. And if you look at the data element of the nested data frame and the first element of there, we get a data frame uh, with uh, the, our first simulation. It has the car data, the price data, the mileage, and the number of views. Okay, but now we want to run a simulation in each of those um, um, data frames. So the first thing is that we need to define a function that uh, runs a linear model. So the first uh, function takes as input a data frame and it's going to create, it's going to run a linear model with the uh, number of views as outcome and price and mileage as dependent variables. And we're going to call that function num views model. And then I'm going to create a second function that takes that input a model and then it's going to output the coefficient of price. And so what that function is going to do is going to look into the coefficients of the model and look at the second coefficient because the first coefficient is the intercept and then it's going to wrap it around as numeric because there's some names that come with it that I want to get rid of them. And I'm going to call this function the function num number of views price coefficient. And so to apply it to all my data frames uh, that have been nested, I need to use the map function from per. So what per does is uh, transforms the input by applying a function to each element and returning a vector of the same length as the input. So our input is going to be a thousand data frames and I'm going to output a thousand linear models and later I'm going to fit it a thousand linear models and I'm going to get back a thousand coefficients. Um, so and how do you do that? Uh, so it's pretty simple. I just start with my nested data frame first and then I apply the mutate statement to it and then within mutate, I'm going to use the map function and I'm going to tell the map function, okay, look in the data elements of this nested data frame and apply to each element the number of views model and then save it back in my nested data frame as an element called model. And once I've run those model, I'm going to apply the map function again and apply it to the model element of it and I'm going to uh, to each model, apply the function number of views price coefficient, which is going to return my coefficient of price, and I'm going to save it in this element price coefficient. Okay? 
So how does this look like once we've run this model? So now we see that there's an element model living in this data frame. And if we look at the first element there, we can verify that there's a, a, a model that lives there that has a number of views as outcome. It has an intercept of price and miles, co miles coefficient. And then if we look in the price co coef element of this nested data frame, we see that we get the coefficient of price that live in the, in the model section of the nested data frame. Um, so now these, all these results are separated in kind of like uh, a thousand different locations in these vectors. So to um, put them back together into one data frame, we use the onNest function. So nesting creates a list column of data frames, but onNesting flats, flattens it back into a regular column, so to get it back into a data frame. And so we feed the onNest function the nested data frame. So that's the first element. And then we ask them, please return the price coefficient part of it. And then we're going to select the simulation ID column and the price coefficient column. And then we're going to save it in these new objects, uh, uh, which is going to be a data frame. And if we inspect in it, we see that effectively we, we get one column with the simulation ID and one coefficient per simulation. So you, you aggregate all your coefficients of your 1,000 models into one data frame. Uh, and then if you decide to plot this data uh, with the coefficients, you tell ggplot, uh, please give me, please uh, take as input data the price coefficients and then run a histogram and then run the team that I like. And so what we see here is that all the 1,000 coefficients follow roughly a normal distribution and that the mean is near uh, minus uh, two. So like if you're taking a linear models class, you might know that like a model is unbiased and then you're like not sure what that means, but then if you plot this distribution, what you can see is that actually the, on average, the model is correct and that the distribution of the coefficient follows a normal distribution, which you might have read in, in a textbook or in your class as well. And then if you want to summarize this whole data, you can take the, the data frame with the coefficients and you can ungroup them because before they were grouped. And you can use the summarize function to create this, um, this summary of the mean, uh, the mean of the coefficient. And to do that, you just apply the mean function to the price coef column. And as well, you can calculate the standard deviation um, by uh, applying the standard deviation function on the price coefficient. And why we see, what we see is that the mean of the, 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 all the coefficients uh, it's uh, very close to the actual value of how we generated the data. And it, but it has some variability ad, around it because we have a standard deviation. Um, yeah, so, so that kind of like you can look into how the linear model performs. And so after you've done that, you can sort of apply this methodology for, to do a power calculation and an A-B test. So kind of like a silly example, on Vroom's website, we might have a random subset of cars that have a uh, a certain uh, resolution of their, on their pictures and some other cars that randomly got a better resolution on the pictures. Kind of like not very intelligent experiment, but, but you can want to see, oh, do cars that have a higher resolution picture, do they get more views on them? So do people end up clicking on them more and, and seeing them? Um, so so what, what, what exactly, so, so that's the A-B test I want to run. And so what's a power calculation while doing an A-B test? So what you want to do is uh, figure out what's the sample size that you need for your A-B test. And given certain inputs, so the inputs are going to be the minimal difference that you're interested in. So I might be interested on my cars that have a higher resolution pictures to um, have on average uh, 10 more views per week. And everything below that, maybe I'm not interested at, at all. So this is the minimum effect that I'm interested uh, I to, to see if the, if the pictures work. And then another thing that I need to fix is the type one error. So I might say it, my type one error is at 5%, so I don't want to make a, um, that, that's what I've established before. And then another thing that I need to tell the simulation is I want a power of at least 90%. So that's uh, my ability to, de to detect the effect there, uh, plus some assumptions about the data. And so sometimes when you, we, when you want to run this test, you might spend a lot of time reading papers or textbooks and find a formula to, that allows you to calculate a sample size. 
the, the thing is that you don't, you don't need a, a formula. You can always just run a simulation. And in many cases, there might not be a, uh, if, if your study or your model is too complicated, there might not exist a formula. So you can all resort to do a simulation. So sometimes you run complicated uh, hierarchical mixed models. Uh, you can run a simulation to calculate that. And so the way you do it is you, you simulate the data with the assumptions and the inputs. And you do this thousands of times. And then you get a p-value of your tests. And then you calculate the proportion of times the p-value is less than the type 1 error rate. And that basically is your power. So no need for any formula. And then if your given uh, sample size doesn't reach that power, then you can keep increasing your, your sample size until, until you reach the power that you want. Um, so that's what we're going to do with what I've shown you so far. And the, uh, kind of following that example on Vroom.com website, but I'm going to also do two things. I'm going to run one linear model that's going to um, have a p-value for the effect of treatment. And I'm going to have a second model where I'm going to adjust for variables or covariates, and, and so which are going to be the miles and the price of the car. And I'm going to see if that approach is more powerful than only including the treatment in the, in the linear model. And so some of my assumptions are going to be that the number of views is normally distributed, and that the number of views depends linearly on price and mileage of the car. And then the inputs is that the new, I have an A-B test for a new uh, layout or a resolution of the pictures on the cars, and that resolution increased the average number of views by 10 views uh, uh, weekly. And I'm going to start with a sample size of 100, OK? So now, and then when I run this simulation, the power is going to be the, uh, yeah, so, so the output is going to be the power given this setup. And we're going to see if we reach the 90% power that we want. And so this is the same uh, ch um, ch uh, chunk code that I showed you before, but I've added two, two, one line and, and I changed to a previous one. So the first line is a treatment variable which is, uh, it calls the R binomial function, and it generates a 0, 1 um, outcome that's uh, kind of like your randomized treatment assignment. And each one of them has a 50% probability. And then what you're going to do is go to your mean number of views, and you're going to make a change to what you had previously, uh, which is this plus 10 times the treatment. So what that means is, on average, a car that's on the treatment is going to have 10 more number of views on average on, on a given week. <coughs> and then the, the rest is the same. Then you run, generate your number of views variable as a uh, normally distributed random variable. Uh, yeah, so then this, the outcome that you get is the same this that frame we saw before, but now you, we have a treatment column with a random assignment of zero and ones for the treatment. And now what I'm going to do is create uh, three functions. So the first two functions is going to uh, build a model that, uh, that explains the number of views based on treatment, and another one that does the same thing, but adjusts for price as well as, uh, uh, as, well as mileage. And then the third one is a function that's going to recover the p-value for the treatment effect in each model. So the first model is going to be the number of views model without adjustment, and the other one is going to be with adjustment. And then the function is going to, the last function is the treatment p-value. That's going to look into the model, apply the summary function to it, then look into the coefficient, and it's going to look at the second row for the treatment uh, effect and then the four column for the, um, for the p-value. And so then we save our, our data frame in this simu AB data frame. And then we're going to do the same thing we did before where we're going to apply, apply a group by statement. And we're going to group the data by simulation ID. And then we're going to nest the data. Uh, so now we're separated the data frame into a thousand different data frames. And I'm going to use the mutate statement, which is going to call the map function. And the map function is going to say, OK, look at my data and build a model uh, for the number of views without the adjustment. But do so also for the model with the adjustment. And then the map function is going to be called again. And we're going to feed it the model without the adjustment. And this is going to output the p-values for the treatment effect. And it's going to do the same thing for the models with adjustment. Um, so now, if we look into the, what lives inside the, this um, simulation IB nested object, we have an um, uh, ID for simulation, we have the data, and we have the model without, model with adjustment, and the p-values from each of those models. 
And so if we see what lives in here, so we can see that there's a model without. And if we look at the first element of it and the coefficients, we see that there's an intercept and a treatment. And then if we look at the element that says model width for the models with adjustment, and we look at the coefficients, we see that we get an intercept of treatment, but as well as a coefficient for price and miles. And so we have effectively created two sets of 1,000 models. And then we see as well that the p-values live in this nested, this nested data frame as well. So now we can unnest the, this nested data frame again by applying the unnest function. And we tell the unnest function, please give me the p-values. Uh, and we save them in a data frame that contains only the p-values without the adjustment, as well as another data frame with the adjustment. And then what we can do is calculate the power of our test using the model only with the treatment. And to do that, we look at the data frame with the p-values and we can apply the summarize function. And then we use the mean function to the p-values. And what this uh, function does is it calculates the proportion of p-values that are less than 5%. And then we, we save it in this uh, column called power with adjustment. And we see that our power is 67.5%. And yeah, so then you've calculated your power very uh, fast in coding time, but not in running time. And and then here we get the power of the, of the model without the adjustments. And we see that the, the power is a little bit lower than the previous model. So it's 56%. So the, the conclusion of this, of this uh, uh, code that you run is that with a sample size of 100, uh, you don't get enough power to get to 90, but you're better off with the model uh, that does the adjustment of the covariates. So if you need to run a different power calculation with any sort of model, uh, or any sort of test, you can just change this code and feed it a function that runs your test to, to your particular data and you can calculate power again. Uh, okay, so that's kind of like the usefulness of, of simulations, but if you want to create uh, uh, some art, you can also use random data to, to do so. So I, I, I stumbled into this gallery while I was walking in New York City and I saw this piece by Manfred Moore and it kind of has this random pattern of lines around it. And I thought, oh, this looks like it could be simulated. And I was thinking it has a hierarchical structure where this grid of, of squares, um, uh, so within this R there's squares that live inside of it and inside each square there's a line that lives inside of it and inside that line there's a dot there's many dots that live inside of it. So it kind of had that hierarchy, hierarchy uh, of a simulation. So I said, if I can simulate one square, then I can simulate this whole piece of art. So I, I went and started to simulate the uh, one square. So the first thing I, I did was, um, okay, I know, I, I think this is actually not a square, but I think it's more of a rectangle that's uh, uh, on the, along the x axis is of length 10, and uh, along the y axis is of length uh, 5. And I'm going to create this dots data frame that contains the initial dot on that line starting from the left. And so the first thing I did is I call a data frame function and I'll, I, I fit it, I call this um, uh, column called number of lines that's a rand, one random draw from a Poisson distribution and with mean 10. And I added a, a plus one here because sometimes you can get a zero. So I want at least one line to live in this square. And then that gives me the number of lines. And so right now that data frame has only one row. But I, then I use the splice function and say, OK, repeat all my rows uh, as, as many lines as I have in, in the end lines column. So if I drew seven lines, then this data frame is going to be repeated seven times. And then I'm going to create the mutated statement. And the first line generates an ID for each line. And the line x star uh, variable is the start of the first point on the x-axis, and that's a sample draw from a number from 2 to 9, so on the x-axis. And on the y-axis as well, I draw a sample from a number from 1 to 5, so to have a start on the y-axis. And I also have a line length, which uh, I draw from a random discrete uniform between 1 and 3, and a line thickness, which is also random between 1 and 5. And then I'm, I call the splice function again, and I say because each line has a length, I need this to be further expanded so that each line gets repeated as, as, as its length. 
So that kind of gives me the, 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 these dots that are framing. We see the first line has a start on the x-axis and a start on the y-axis. And it has a line length, so it's just length one, so it's just one dot. But for the second line, it has length two. And that, that, uh, the, uh, right now, I only have the start of the line, but I don't have the, the, how the line moves. So that's what I'm going to do next. So I'm going to create this lines data frame that is going to add to these initial points so that the line has a movement. So the first thing that I'm going to do is group by the line ID. And so what that does is the next mutate statement um, operates only at the line ID level. And so the first thing, I, as I create this x-axis line, which tells me where my line is in the x-axis. And that for that, I take the beginning uh, dot and I just add a vector of going from 0 to its length. So it's just moving one step every time. And then on the y-axis steps, the line is going to move up and down from its beginning. Uh, and I accomplish that by doing a random draw from a vector of minus 1 and 1. And then I add that vector to the, 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 to the beginning of the line on the x-axis. So if the line started at 3, then it can move up to 4, uh, 3, or stay and move up and down. And then at the end, I ungroup, and I save this data frame in this lines data frame. And that's all I need to do. And that basically generates that entire, um, almost entire that art. So to apply a ggplot to it, I tell ggplot, OK, use my x-axis line and my y-axis lines at the coordinates of my points. And, and use as group the line ID, because each, one, each line is going to be its own line. And each line gets a size. And I want everything to be color black. And then I'm going to call the geom line function. But because I've used the group statement previously, it's going to build each line, a different line for each line ID. And then I call this geom h line function, which is going to generate five different um, horizontal lines that are going to give the look of the each square. And so if you plot this, it kind of looks like this kind of weird pattern over here. And so that's kind of like your square. And so but I want to simulate these multiple times over a grid of squares. So the only uh, minor change that I make to my code is now I define uh, uh, parameters as n numbers of squares. And I want a grid as uh, 20 by 20. And then what I'm going to start is I'm going to start with a data frame that has a column that squares IDs, which is um, uh, IDs going from 1 up to uh, 20 by 20, so for the total number of squares. But then everything else is very similar. So now I have a mutated statement that is going to give me per square a random number of lines that are going to live there. So each square is going to get, get a random subset of lines. But then everything else is pretty similar. So this, this uh, chunk plus a little bit more generates that whole piece of art. And then you can generate the same ggplot as you saw before, but over a grid. And you kind of like get this thing that it's kind of like a very similar reproduction of what Malfred did which I thought it was really cool that I, I, I thought it will take me m m much longer. And, so and something I forgot to mention is that Malfred, he did this work in the 80s or 70s using Fortran. Mm -hmm. So there were like pages and pages of, of Fortran code to generate this. And but with, with the tidyverse, it was you know a couple of chunks of code plus a chunk of ggplot, uh, and you get this. And then so uh, my, my boss, uh, director of data science has this machine that's called the XY plotter. And so you can fit it uh, um, uh, these um, PNGs that you've saved from R, and it will like draw it like little by little with this pencil. Like, you just give it a random pen. You can even give it a pencil as well, and it will draw things. And so then, um, you know, my, my boss framed it. That was really nice. <laughs> and so now we have this art around the office uh, for a change instead of a bunch of cars around. So. And yes, yeah, so um, that's uh, like you can all be artists with the tidyverse and ggplot. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's it. Thank you. And I want to say a special thanks to Ludmilla Yanda, my wife, um, because she li listened to this talk like many times. And also <laughs> my, my boss, uh, Jeff, because he printed the, the art and brought it to the office today. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you.
thank you. Um, I was wondering, just to start off the question, you know, um, very, very neat slide. How did you make them? Do you want to say? Um, how did I make one? How did you make the slides? The slides, I went on R Studio, new file, R <laughs> Markdown, <laughs> and I think it's I slides, HTML presentation, yeah. and just went from there. Yeah, uh, I mean, what, what else did I do? Then I looked up, oh, how do you include an image? And there's an, then there's an e uh, neither comment to add, a, add a, um, uh, an image, and then just figure out how to sometimes show code, but not run it. So I think that one's, uh, I forgot. It's eval equals false, yeah, I think so, yeah that doesn't run it, and then if you want to, to run it but don't show the code, you say echo equals false in the knit chunk, and yeah, super easy. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the great talk. One thing I was wondering is, it looked like you didn't set the C here. Yeah, 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 uh, that's, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for asking that. Yeah, so when you set the C, like normally globally, yeah. Uh, well, that's a real call. Uh, usually when I've done it, it does. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a caveat there. I don't think so. And uh, so thank you for asking this. So like for people that are new to um, doing simulations or generating random data in R, so if you run this code and then you run it again, it's going to look different. Uh, so if you want the random numbers to be the same, you, s you use this function that c dot, sorry, set dot c, then put an integer in there, and that kind of sets the start of your random generating machine. Uh, because they're, they're actually called pseudo random numbers because you can set up this number in the c, and then you'll get the same set of numbers. Uh, and that's all I will say about that for now. Thank you. Uh, there you Oops. Um, oh, that's a good point. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, okay. Let me let me say that. So, like, I the way I've sort of learned it is um, when I'm trying to apply a method or construct something, I try to see how the data has arrived to me and kind of write down that process, maybe in a piece of paper, make a little graph. And, and if you have that correct, you kind of get a general idea of, of, um, of how you can go about simulating the data, yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's papers, like if you look in the literature, there's papers on simulations for power calculations. I think that would be the easiest thing to start uh, because they, 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 they sometimes tell you don't do this, do that, so if you do that, you might get something really fast, yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Just curious, um, have you ever had to simulate ordered and unordered categorical data that is strongly related with continuous variables? And, and I, mean, I find it really messy. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you have any words of advice or tips. So you, 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 you want to similar ordinal data that is uh, correlated to a continuous outcome. Uh, and is your ordinal data the outcome itself or, or is it just a variable or is it just like it's some data that you have? In some cases it's covariate, in some cases I have two outcomes which are also ordered mm -hmm. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th there's couple, there's couple things you could do. So the the thing that you could do, I mean, this maybe is a little convoluted, but you can have like a latent variable that you simulate as being continuous, and that uh, your continuous outcome that you're interested in depends on that continuous da latent variable uh, somehow. So maybe you have a normal distribution and you simulate that as being uh, your latent variable plus another normal distribution, okay? And then you can do kind of, um, for your ordinal 
random variable, you can make it so that the probabilities are generated based on that latent variable. So you kind of create a, a, a dependency between those two. That's one of the standard ways to do it. Um, yeah, but I can give you, I can give you more details. I probably need to explain a little bit more. I just want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but there's definitely ways that you can do this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So something that you can do in your, let's say you're doing a power calculation, but you have, you have data on, on what you're trying to run your tests on. So you have idea of what the distributions look like. Uh, so you could do something like that too, where you have uh, your random data actually comes from data that exists, but you might run a, like a bootstrap sample from it and then run your ABC. So that's something that you can do too, uh, as well, and probably matches better the distribution of the actual data that you've seen. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to include that in this talk, but it's just too much information. But yeah. Uh. The, the way we've used simulations before is more like a study design planning. Like you would, um, you have a new methodology and you, you create new fake data and you see, okay, if I have this data or this, let's say my data, um, it's data on cars. So I say, okay, if I apply this method, I save money on how I fix my cars. But then if I apply the, the previous uh, method or like industrial method, I maybe lose money. So that kind of gives me an idea of, or if my new method is going to work. Um, so kind of decision making and study planning, but it's not so much as um, um, compared to what's in production, because I guess the next step to that will be, okay, I'm going to run an actual A-B test, and that's what actually confirms to me if this thing works or not. Uh, yeah, does that kind of answer yeah. your question? Well, yeah. So maybe could you just give a few more examples of how to uh, Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, so, so right now we were thinking about changing like a different, uh, sh uh, like how we fix our cars. And there's some like decision tree of how we fix our cars. And, and so there's an old method that we know and we have a new method. And we were kind of doing what the previous person asked is like, do you use past data? So we use past data and we pass it through these methods and we can use the bootstrap to create some randomness around it. And we say, okay, if we kept to the previous method, uh, we will have, fix our cost and it will have cost us this much. But if we use the new method, maybe we save money, right? So that kind of, and, and we use the, the, the randomness in view from the bootstrap of our previous historical data. Yeah, does that kind of make sense? And your de de decision makers listen to you? Yes, so, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, yeah. But this was actually an ask from high up, so that was kind of exciting, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to hang out for a bit outside. Um, again, if you're hiring, please stick around for a bit so you get a chance to speak to everyone. And we're going to be going to um, Bria House on 17 between 10 and 6. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Sebastian. No, thank you. Thank you all for coming.